Three and a half years ago, I came very close to having a car crash. It was 5.45 in the morning and I was driving to work. And if you live in the UK and are crazy enough to be up at that time, there's a programme on the radio called Farming Today. And I was listening to that half asleep. They featured on the programme the Oxford Farming Conference, which is the centre point of the UK's farming industry, where representatives of the biggest farms, farm businesses and even government ministers come to talk about the industry that is farming. The theme that year was the future. And I listened to a vaguely interesting interview with the head of a large tractor company. And they were talking about the future as they saw it. Vast vehicles delivering incremental efficiency for the industrial process that is arable farming. These vehicles were becoming driverless, which meant that more could be done by less people. Whole fields could be sprayed faster, ploughs could go deeper, drills could chuck seed into the ground faster, all with fewer or even no people, which was fascinating stuff. But then, the next interview was with a professor from the Agricultural University in the rural northwest of England. In serious considered tones, Professor Simon Blackmore spoke of a revolution. He started by politely refuting the value of big industrial vehicles. He even questioned that farming is an industrial process at all. Farming, he said, is not about the cranking out of a crop. Farming is about the caring for plants. And each plant, despite centuries of driving towards uniformity, is still different. So instead of treating the field as a single data point and the uniform application of chemicals and fertiliser, we should be looking at each individual plant and caring for it at that level. This is not the work for big industrial machines. This is the work for small, precise, accurate vehicles. This is the work for artificial intelligences. This is the work for robots. By using these robots, we could only use the chemicals and fertilisers on the plants that needed it. By using these robots, we could not only produce more food, but we could make the whole system sustainable. As far as I could see it, this was the future. It was the future of food. It was the future of the environment. It was the future survival of mankind. And they'd all been defined by those serious studious tones. That was when I nearly crashed the car. That was my moment of change. So I guess right now you're wondering, what do you mean the future of food? Surely farming's pretty good, right? We all eat, in fact, more people eat more food now than they've ever done in the past. And food poverty, while still bad, has dropped by 70% since 1945. Then, at the end of World War II, the Third Agricultural Revolution really kicked off. And between 1945 and 1995, average wheat production in some places more than doubled. Industrial farming in Europe and North America went from producing three tonnes per hectare with small tractors and small fields, sometimes using horses and small, uh, a few chemicals, to eight tonnes per hectare in massive fields with large tractors and the heavy use of chemicals and fertilisers. But meanwhile, across the majority of the world, the people who can't afford to buy the machinery, who had a farm too small to use these massive vehicles, lost out. The majority of farms in Africa and Asia, for example, are not hundreds or thousands of hectares. They are five hectares, or one. These hundreds of millions of farmers largely missed out on those advancements in yield. And then, even in Europe and North America, the improvement stopped. Since 1995, the trend line for wheat production in the world has flatlined. And big agriculture, the multi-billion pound revenue companies that make the machinery and the chemicals that drive the modern industrial agricultural process, have been trying to fix it. As I mentioned from the start, they are ramping up their industrial processes in the only way that industrial companies know how, by making things bigger and faster and more. And as a result, things are changing. Over 40% of the world's fields are degraded. And that 
is just getting worse. Soil compaction in the UK is costing £1 billion a year in lost earnings. Since 1961, soils have lost 30% of their carbon and nitrogen. The UK loses 2.2 million tonnes of soil a year straight into the rivers and then into the sea. Why? Well, to put it simply, these big attractors crush the soil. They turn the soil into a hard rock-like substance that simply cannot support life. So to counter this, farmers have to plough. They have to turn over the soil and break it up. But by doing this, they release all the lovely topsoil with all its lovely nutrients to the wind and the rain, where it is washed or blown away. It also destroys, or exposes to predators, the worms and the beetles that create nutrients and eat the pests. When you lose these nutrients, and these natural defences, you have to apply chemicals. Herbicides, pesticides, fungicides and fertilisers. And they are ever more expensive. So farmers, all farmers, are slowly going out of business. In fact, the third agricultural revolution that views food as an industrial process is dead. A system where greater production and greater efficiency is driven by bigger machinery and more chemicals has stopped working. The wasteful, unsustainable mass production of food needs to be replaced. Replaced with a system that is precise and accurate and efficient. A system that knows every plant and understands what that plant needs. A system that both increases food production and reduces chemicals. A system that feeds the world, but does it sustainably. Welcome to the fourth agricultural revolution. So, let's go back to that near car crash. So as soon as I got into work, I emailed Simon. By lunchtime, we were talking and I was inspired to think about how it could be possible to make this vision of light, precise robots on a farm into a reality. This really kicked off when, a couple of months later, he introduced me to Sam, a fourth generation arable farmer. Sam saw the problems firsthand. When he returned to his family farm, he saw that their yields hadn't increased since the 90s and then their costs had doubled. He too could see the damage that was being done and had been inspired to think about how this old system could be torn up and done in a radical new way. It took one call between us for us to realise we were two sides of the same coin. We could both see the massive problem on the farm. But what do farmers think? So, my background is in user experience, and this helped me to realise that the technology is all very well, but if people don't want to use it or it doesn't work for them, then they won't adopt it. So Sam spent months finding out, six months on the road, sitting in farm kitchens, just listening. What were their fears? What would they trust? How do they feel about the potential of technology? How open were they to adopting it? And the results were staggering to us. Farmers were not the Luddites that I had assumed. They understood the technology and no one knew better than the stresses that were being put on the soil and the environment. Some of these farmers viewed their lives on the farm as 40 experiments and want nothing more than those experiments to make things more efficient and more environmentally friendly. But they simply don't have the money to buy new farming machinery that may or may not work, nor could they afford the machinery that would be superseded the following year, or might break down, or be the target for thieves. So we came up with farming as a service. A model that wasn't based around the machinery itself, but around the outcomes the machinery is designed to provide. A model that doesn't automate a single function, but delivers a healthy crop at the end of the year. A model that is paid for per hectare. A model that farmers can trial easily with no risk. But most importantly, a service that cares for a crop by understanding each individual plant. And to make this model work, we realised that we would not have to have one single purpose robot, but three distinct robots that did three distinct jobs 
I would like to introduce you to Tom, Dick and Harry, a service of precise and lightweight robots that don't compact the soil and carry out all the processes of planting and monitoring and caring for the crop right up to the point of harvest. Tom lives on the farm, collecting data all day, every day. Data on each individual crop plant, the soil, the weeds, the pests and the diseases. Tom works completely autonomously, navigating the fields and returning to its kennel at the end of the day to recharge and share the information that he has captured. Dick is a crop care robot, sent out to the farm only when necessary, who kills the weeds using electricity, treats individual plants against pests and diseases, and feeds only the plants that are hungry. Because Dick only kills the weeds that actually threaten a crop, wild plants can be left to grow, stopping the imbalance caused by green deserts of crop fields. Because Dick only sprays the plants that need fungicide or pesticide, huge amounts of chemicals are saved and invertebrates can thrive. Harry plants each seed individually at exactly the right depth and exactly the right spacing, straight into the previous year's stubble with no ploughing and no tillage. By not disturbing the soil, it is retaining up to four tonnes of carbon in the soil that would have been released by ploughing. Tom, Dick and Harry are nothing without the brains of the operation Wilma, and Wilma turns the information from Tom into instructions for Dick and Harry. Wilma uses AI to sort through all the data and work out which plants are healthy and which need help. Wilma shows the farmer what is happening and provides us with a global view of the progress of all the crops. Together, Tom, Dick, Harry and Wilma can make a huge difference. They can reduce chemicals and energy uses by over 90%. They can bring the level of CO2 emissions down from around 5 tonnes per hectare to actually sequestering carbon in the soil. Tom, Dick and Harry can make farms profitable again across the world because we can deliver this service without farmers having to buy the technology, we can work with farmers of any size, no matter where they are in the world, which means that this revolution can be global. Small Robot Company is one of hundreds of agritech startups from around the world. Most of those are focused on the fourth agricultural revolution goals of precision and accuracy and sustainability. And with the farmer's support and the support of the governments and you, we can change farming into a sustainable, carbon-positive benefit to mankind and the world we live in. We believe that we can make all these farms environmentally sustainable. We believe we can make those farms carbon-positive. We can turn farmers from being the villains of the environmental crisis that we find ourselves in into being the heroes that they truly are. But most of all, in this time of unremitting negative news, when it is difficult to know how one person can make a difference, we think our three small robots have one more job. They can bring hope. Thank you.